From WBUR Boston and NPR, I'm Ray Suarez, and this is On Point. Fellow humans, we are at an inflection point. AI, artificial intelligence, started off at a crawl years ago. Today, it's galloping ahead. Computers have been voraciously gobbling up our online data and have already learned a heck of a lot. Now they're almost ready for takeoff, and some of the biggest voices in the field say we have to figure out how to keep something more powerful than us within our power. This hour on point, the call for a set of rules for our computers. You can join us on air or online. Do you really believe computers are getting not only faster, but smarter than us? Do you welcome that? Do you want to see a code of ethics in technology that will keep humans safe? Join us anytime at onpointradio.org or on Twitter and Facebook at On Point Radio. Joining me from Paris, France, is Stuart Russell, one of the pioneers in artificial intelligence, founder of the Center for Human-Compatible Artificial Intelligence at UC Berkeley. He wrote the standard textbook, co-wrote the standard textbook in his field. Two years ago, he wrote an open letter calling for ethical AI, that's been signed by over 8,000 people, including many of the top names at Google, Facebook, Microsoft. Last year, he commissioned a video called Slaughterbots in the run-up to a UN conference on arms control for autonomous weapons. You can find a link to Russell's open letter, the Slaughterbots video, and more on our website, onpointradio.org. Stuart Russell, I'm almost hesitating to say I'm delighted to talk to you, but let me say (laughs) welcome to On Point. Hi, Ray. Thank you. Uh, You know, I talk to techno-utopians, techno-dystopians. I hear all kinds of plausible scenarios for our near future, from robots that can become intuitive companions to housebound elderly people, learn their habits and their personalities, and I say, oh, bravo. And then uh, here, in the next moment, practically, Uh, about a future where robots, without us even realizing it, control the aspects of life that that shape our daily existence. What is it that I should be worried about? So I think the first thing to do is is not to think about it as forecasting the weather. We're not saying, okay, tomorrow it's going to rain or tomorrow it's going to be, you know, 75 and sunny. Uh, We should think about it as trying to steer a course, uh, it's as if we're, you know, the captain of a ship and we want to make sure that we know where the icebergs are uh, and that we don't crash into them. So um, what you're worried about, I think, depends on the time scale that you're looking at. Right now, there are things to worry about today. Um, there are AI systems generating fake news, uh, generating fake videos, uh, being used to persuade people to change their behavior, whether it's their commercial behavior buying or political behavior, who they vote for. Um, There's even automated blackmail. So there are programs that read your email uh, and follow your texts and follow your movements on your iPhone and figuring out if you're doing something you shouldn't be doing and then they start blackmailing you. So those are things that are happening now. Um, Another thing that's happening now, as you mentioned, the Slaughterbots video is about autonomous weapons. And I just came from that meeting that you mentioned, the United Nations meeting in Geneva, where the Russian ambassador said, you know, we don't need to worry about these things. You know, they are decades away in the future. Um, And Kalashnikov, which is a major Russian arms corporation, uh, is actually selling autonomous weapons. Um, We just heard uh, this week about a mass drone attack on a Russian base in Syria by 13 drones uh, that were... Uh, launched by an unknown party, so we don't even know where they came from. Um, So these things are moving very, very quickly. Um, But before your listeners start to worry that these these killer robots are the ones that we have to worry about taking over the world, um, these are two very, very different things. The the killer robots can be dangerous without any um, ability to take over the world, just like, you know, a gorilla armed with a machine gun could be very dangerous, even though you're not worried about the gorilla with the machine gun taking over the world. Um, So um, the danger with autonomous weapons is that people use them uh, effectively in in very, very large numbers uh, to create a weapon of mass destruction. They can do things an individual warrior 
can't do. And I think that's yep. that's an aspect of this that shapes not only weapons, but a lot of the conversation about the future of AI. Much of what we think of as the future ability of our machines is shaped by, conditioned by, science fiction. In the 1968 film 2001, A Space Odyssey, the supercomputer HAL refuses to listen to orders from astronaut Dr. Dave Bowman. Dave wants to disconnect HAL, take control of the spaceship, but HAL is programmed to let nothing get in the way of his mission. Hello, HAL, do you read me? Do you read me, HAL? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, HAL. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. And I think what made what made the HAL 9000 so <laughs> creepy is that he was perfectly calm and rational sounding when refusing to do what Keir DeLay was asking him to do, which, um, yeah, I mean, that seems like part of the possibility of a future sentient machine. Yeah, so uh, there's another episode in the same movie a little earlier on, which actually sets the scene where Dave is playing chess against HAL. And, you know, Dave loses, and Hal treats Dave like a little child. You know, Dave, your, your game is really improving. Um, and it's there to show that Hal can outthink uh, Dave, no matter how, what Dave tries. Um, but fortunately, in order to have a plot for the movie, uh, eventually Dave does outwit Hal and manages to switch Hal off. Uh, if Hal had really been a super intelligent machine, then Hal would have outwitted Dave, uh, and there wouldn't, there wouldn't have been much of a movie. So all, all the humans would be dead. This week um, I came across an example yeah. that cut a little closer to the bone since I've made my living as a reporter for the last 40 years. The Economist magazine trained an AI program on how to write a news article. And in its science and technology section, it gave the program all the information that a journalist would need to produce an article. Uh, it came out... Like, you could tell there was something wrong with it, but at the same time, it was pretty good for a machine, pretty close, though the story didn't always make sense. WBUR producer and performer Amory Sivertson dug deep to find the soul of the machine, and here she is reading part of that story written by an intelligent machine. The result is a shape of an alternative to electric cars. But the most famous problem is that the control system is then powered by a computer that is composed of a second part of the spectrum. The first solution is far from cheap. But if it is a bit like a solid sheet of contact with the spectrum, it can be read as the sound waves are available. This is way, way beyond what a computer was able to do even a couple of years ago. This is moving very quickly. I'm not so sure that I would be very convinced by uh, that that story. So I'll, I'll tell you another little story. So this morning um, I had some ibuprofen on the counter, some Advil if you like, and um, it got knocked off on the floor. And my dog, being a puppy, immediately ate it um, before I could pick it up. So then I'm like, okay, how do we make the dog throw up? So I go, on, go online and, and, and it turns out that... Um, if you ask questions about how to, you know, how to cure your pets, uh, there are lots and lots of AI systems that are answering those questions. So, you know, you find this, a conversation on uh, justanswers.com and it says, oh, hi, you know, my dog just swallowed ibuprofen, you know, what should I do? And the AI system answers, well, how much does ibuprofen weigh and how old is he? <laughs> uh, so it sort of it thinks ibuprofen is the name of the dog. Uh, so... Um, so I, I think that we can make demos that are uh, very impressive. And there are real uh, advances going on. So particularly the ability to recognize objects in images and to do speech recognition. Uh, you know, I would say it's doubled or tripled in quality in the last few years. Um, and in some, uh, in some senses, it's actually superior to human abilities, uh, particularly apparently in recognizing different breeds of dog. Um, so... Uh, so progress is very rapid, but we are uh, a long way from uh, having something like HAL, uh, which in many ways is superhuman across the whole spectrum of knowledge and reasoning and planning 
uh, ability to uh, have a conversation, ability to read lips, uh, which is part of the plot in the movie. Um, so I think very few people are saying super intelligent AI is right around the corner and, you know, we have to put the brakes on it, you know, we have to stop doing this. Um, what, what the debate is about is, um, first of all, when is it going to happen? Is it going to happen and how long is it going to take? Um, and if it's going to come, what are the risks that we need to start thinking about now? And, uh, and the how, you know, the 2001 movie uh, is actually a pretty good description of what the problem is. So how has a mission, the mission has been given to him, which is in fact completely mysterious in the movie, but it's something to do with, uh, you know, getting to Jupiter and then finding this, the second obelisk and getting in touch with the alien species that put it there. Um, and nothing, once, once a machine has been given an objective, um, it's not going to be convinced by someone speaking that it should adopt a different objective, you know, unless the objective already included, you know, but if Dave says do this, do this, then you have to listen to Dave and not complete the mission finding the obelisk. Um, so this is the issue. And um, there's a very nice quote from Norbert Wiener, who was a very famous mathematician uh, in the 20th century. And in 1960, he said, we have to be absolutely sure that the purpose we put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Um, and so this is the core of the problem. We might call this the King Midas problem because King Midas said, you know, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. And he got exactly what he specified or he got his purpose. And then he died in misery and starvation because his food and his drink turned to gold. I'm talking with one of the top voices in the field of artificial intelligence who says we desperately need to give our computers an ironclad set of rules that will make sure they work to our benefit. What rules, what Ten Commandments would you give the world's computers? I'm Ray Suarez. This is On Point. How much would you pay to avoid morning traffic? Why are plane tickets to Boise so expensive? And what can a tuna cannery in the middle of the Pacific tell us about taxes? I'm Cardiff Garcia, co-host of The Indicator, a new podcast from Planet Money, where in every episode, we take on a new unexpected idea to help you make sense of the day's news. Get it on NPR One or wherever you get your podcasts. This is On Point. I'm Ray Suarez. We're hearing the debate within the world of AI about whether we need to build fail-safes into our computers now while they're on the brink of becoming more powerful than we are. You can join the conversation. Do you believe we can control our computers? Do you think we can design them so they remain in our service, advance us, and not leave us behind? Later on in the program, we'll hear from Sebastian Thrun, another big voice in the field but a techno-optimist, Right now, we'll continue with my guest, Stuart Russell, a man expert enough to have earned the right to worry. Stuart Russell, one of the pioneers in artificial intelligence, founder of the Center for Human-Compatible Artificial Intelligence at Berkeley. Uh, let's take a listen to what some of our listeners have been writing on our website and on social media. And Steph says, just a rhetorical question, when it comes to making complex decisions, we don't fully understand the factors that influenced our reasoning. We make up explanations to account for our decisions, but those explanations are not always accurate. Are we trying to hold AI to a higher standard than we apply to our own decision-making? Jerry writes on Facebook, the U.S. must have excellent product liability laws. Our product liability laws are weak in the technology sector and have been for quite some time. We must elect politicians who are skilled in writing good and ethical laws. Until those laws are in place and enforced, we should exercise prudence when using technology and minimize our risks. Stuart Russell, is there a market-based solution to the problems you're worried about in the future? Um, well, I think the market does actually play a role. Uh, I was just thinking about um, the, you know, whether Chernobyl could have been prevented by product liability. So the, you know, total cost of Chernobyl was getting on for a trillion dollars. So I think, you know, a liability insurance policy probably wouldn't have helped that much. Um, but uh, the way the market helps is that we have to solve this problem in miniature 
uh, long before we reach super intelligent machines. So let's take a very simple example. If you want to have an intelligent personal assistant that you know, helps you organize your travel, you know, books you into the right hotel, puts you on the right flight, uh, you know, make sure that you, you know how to get from the airport to the hotel and so on. So how does that system know whether you're, you know, me, who, you know, isn't going to spend more than 200 bucks a night on a hotel, or President Trump, who, you know, would probably stay in the, the presidential suite for $25,000 a night. Um, humans are different, and a piece of software is going to have to learn the preferences of the person that they are working for. Otherwise, uh, people are not going to buy it. I, you know, if President Trump's not going to use it if it puts him in a $200 a night room, and I'm not going to use it if it puts me in a $25,000 a night room. So, um, so commercial forces mean that we have to solve the problem of how AI systems learn about the preferences of individual people, uh, and then learn to you know help be, uh, you know help people achieve their objectives, uh, and also trade off between the objectives of the person they're, they're quote, working for and, and other people. Um, so I, I made up a little um, anecdote when I was trying to explain this at a meeting one day. Um, so you come home from work and your personnel, your personal assistant reminds you that um, you have a very important dinner at 7.30 and you say, what, what dinner is that? And, and he says, oh, it's your, you know, your 20th anniversary. You have to go to dinner with your wife. And you say, oh, oh no, I totally forgot. You know, I'm, I've already booked, booked dinner with, you know, with the CEO. And an assistant says, ah, I did warn you, but you overrode my recommendation. And you're, okay, well, what am I going to do now? And the assistant says, well, I just arranged for the CEO's plane to be delayed until tomorrow morning. And, and he sends his apologies, and he's going to have lunch with you tomorrow instead. So, you know, problem solved. Uh, you, get to, you get to meet with the CEO. The CEO thinks it's his fault and not yours, and you still get to have dinner with the wife. Now, you wouldn't want an AI system to behave that way because, you know, it's not respecting the preferences of, you know, the CEO and everyone else on the plane and the airline and so on. It's just trying to solve your problem. So, so these kinds of uh, events mean that, uh, you know, a system that is not built with uh, the ability to learn preferences and to respect preferences of others correctly is going to be a huge liability. And so uh, as AI systems start to be able to impact the real world, you absolutely have got to figure out how to make them what we call provably beneficial, meaning that I, I can mathematically prove that they won't make that kind of a mess. Stuart Russell joins us from Paris. Our next stop this hour is Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Isabel is calling. Welcome to the program. Hi, Ray. Thank you for taking my call. I um, was uh, intrigued by this conversation. I am an academic, and we just submitted a few weeks ago a panel for uh, the Academy of Management Conference, which is a very large conference with over 10,000 participants. And it was about the social and ethical implications of artificial intelligence. And the reason that we, with a group of colleagues, presented this is because we see the conversation is absent in our classrooms. Uh, we educators don't discuss what are the uh, impacts on different stakeholders, what is the, are the social or ethical implications of inventing everything we can. And the accent is, uh, or the focus is, everything that we can innovate is cool. But there, uh, there is an inner landscape about values, about thinking in the long term or the broader scope that is just not addressed. And so that is the reason we, we presented that paper. Um, I was just intrigued about this conversation. Boy, Isabel, right you are. That idea, that almost determinism, that if we can think of it, then it must be okay. Uh, drives a lot of the innovation that's going on. What's your reaction, Stuart Russell? I have to say I completely agree with Isabel. Um, and partly for that reason, I'm rewriting my textbook uh, so that these issues are you know, front and center right there in Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. Um, but I think in general, the computer science community has been very slow just to take itself seriously. I think um, particularly in AI, we've spent so long just trying to get anything to work that um, 
we haven't worried too much about the you know ethical and social impacts in the way that for example the biologists have worried about it. because you know biologists have have been very much under the public eye for thousands of years because you know doctors are cutting holes in you, they better they better know what they're doing. Um, whereas you know, AI people have been playing chess and, and making robots dance up and down. And, you know, there's not been the opportunity for, for big impact on human life. But that's changing very quickly and I think computer science absolutely has to catch up. Um, and I, I recommend that everyone read a story um, by E.M. Forster, you know, who, who usually wrote novels of, of Victorian and Edwardian manners. Uh, but he wrote a short story called The Machine Stops in 1909. Um, and in that story, uh, human beings sort of live within a machine that takes care of all of their needs. You know, everyone has their own little cell in the honeycomb, so to speak, and it, look, it provides them with food and drink and entertainment, communication. They have internet, they have iPads, they have video conferencing, they spend a lot of time listening to lectures on uh, massive open online courses, uh, and, and the human race becomes completely dependent uh, on the machine to the point where they actually no longer even understand how it works, uh, which is a re you know, recipe for disaster, as it turns out. So, and this is a slippery slope. The people who live in that machine think that they have the best possible world, that the old civilization where people were outside, where people met each other in person, where people did things other than read and think and talk, uh, you know, that that old world was horrific and, and the new world is the best one. And so it shows how our uh, our culture, our, our own values are, are actually quite plastic uh, and fragile and can be mold, molded um, by the environment that we're in. And we go down this slippery slope. Um, and WALL-E, you know, is another, the movie uh, WALL-E is another example where the people who live on the spaceship in WALL-E uh, you know, which has to leave the Earth because the Earth has been turned into a, you know, a, an ecological disaster. Um, so the human race is now on these giant spaceships and they're all looked after by these machines and they all become obese and, and sort of stupid. They sit there with their faces glued to screens all day long. Um, and, and this sort of enfeeblement is something we have to be very concerned about. Um, so in some sense, we now, you know, after millennia, we now have the power to do anything we want with the world, or we soon will, uh, and we don't know how to use that power. Well, Stuart, I'm, I'm about to give you a little bit more, well, better informed pushback than genial me. Uh, let's introduce Sebastian Thrun. He's also a big voice in artificial intelligence. He's been called the godfather of Google's self-driving car. He was a VP there. He's a founding director of Stanford University's Artificial Intelligence Lab, chairman and co-founder of the online university Udacity, and he joins us from where else? Palo Alto? Sebastian, welcome to On Point. Hi, Ray, and hi, Stuart. Uh, so hi, would, your, would your advice be uh, don't worry so much, Sebastian? I would say that technology in general has a history of, of good users and bad users. I mean, technology that can be abused includes the kitchen knife, it includes nuclear weapons, and AI will be no exception. But we've seen an amazing number of great new innovations using AI that empower people to do things they've never been able to do before. And while I understand kind of the fearful perspective that's being laid out here, that's partially fueled, obviously, by the movie industry, I think there's a great benefit to build, for example, self-driving cars that enable blind people to use motor vehicles safely that we should not be dismiss. But can we build in um, guideposts around a field that, uh, that so far is not hemmed in by... Uh, folkways, practices, standards that are of long duration. Before we, we think of AI as the Armageddon of the world, let's, let's add a dose of realism to this. And, and let's ask, what is AI really doing? There's been amazingly great examples of AI systems playing games like the game of Go at a human level scale, finding skin cancer better than the best human dermatologist or flying airplanes. And what all these systems do is something very, very, very simple. They observe a repetitive task, something like 
a pilot in an, in an air cockpit or a driver in a car. And after watching long enough, they can repeat what the person does. And they do it very well. So, for example, I spent better part of my career building self-driving cars, first at Stanford and then at Google. And we've gotten to the point where these cars basically are safer than human drivers. Give you uh, statistics, we, we kill in traffic more than one million people, humans do, um, every, every year around the world. And the Google self-driving car has driven more than two million miles and has only had one small fender bender in its entire accident history. It's something that people can't do. And this machine just replicates good driving behavior. It has absolutely none of the skills that is being laid out on this, on this radio show. It can't enslave people. It can't redirect planes. It can't issue drone strikes. It can't even fly a plane. It, it can only repeat this one very simple thing, which is how to turn a steering wheel. Stuart Russell, is there a, a yeah, but uh, <laughs> answer to Sebastian Thrun? Well, so, so uh, yeah, several yeah, buts. So, so the first one is, uh, yes, of course, there are benefits to AI. If there were no benefits, people wouldn't even be doing AI. And, and I wouldn't be talking to you about this because there would be no progress uh, and there would be nothing to worry about. Um, so it, it's sort of like saying, well, electricity is is useful for lots of things. Look, you know, you can you can shave, you can boil water, you can do this, you can do that. Electricity is fantastic. Therefore, we don't need to worry about nuclear power stations exploding. Well, it's exactly the opposite. If the nuclear power station explodes, which was what happened with Chernobyl, then we stop getting the benefits. Uh, in fact, the you know, nuclear power station construction was cut by 90 percent after Chernobyl. So we have lost a lot of the benefits. Almost all the benefits of nuclear power have been lost because people did not pay enough attention to the risks. And so to say electricity is good for you has really nothing to do with it. Um, and of course, if it wasn't good for you, we wouldn't be building nuclear power stations. Um, but I, I totally agree with Sebastian that the, the focus is not on the way AI systems behave now. We are not building general purpose AI systems uh, that can do anything. But I do want to point out something. So um, we used to say about six months ago, or even a month ago, that um, you know AlphaGo is, is amazing. You know, pretty much from scratch, it, it learned not not by imitating humans actually, but uh, by playing itself to to exceed all human players at the game of Go, which has been played for for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but we always said, well, you know, AlphaGo is brilliant, but you know, AlphaGo can't play chess. It can't play checkers. Uh, you know, it's a very, very narrow system, so don't think that it's going to take over the world. Well, so it turned out that um, the people who built AlphaGo decided to see if it could play chess. And in two hours, uh, AlphaGo learned to play chess better than any human being, as well as Go, as well as Chinese chess or Shogi. So, um, so I think things are moving very, very rapidly, and it's very dangerous to say, you know, AI can't do... X and Y and Z and probably never will, uh, those predictions have always turned out to be false in the past. Sebastian? Look, um, I completely agree as we build new technologies and invent new technologies, there will be accidents. And last I checked, there's still more than 400 nuclear power plants in operations in the world. And last I checked, despite the horrible, tragic accident and, and human failure in Chernobyl, we are still benefiting from electricity. I want to point out this radio conversation would not be possible without electricity. And I have yet to meet people who say because of Chernobyl, we should stop using electricity. We need to see things in balance. We need to understand that every technology has dangers and risks, risks of accidents, risk of abuse, but also positive aspects and empowering things. And Stanford, we recently looked into diagnostics, medical diagnostics. There's about 10,000 dermatologists uh, in, in the United States. They're very hard to get by. They make roughly $450,000 a year. It's a well-paid job. And we asked the question, can we learn from those dermatologists to find deadly diseases like skin cancer, melanomas, using camera images so that we can take that same skill into places where world-class dermatologists don't operate, like, say, the Middle East or, or Africa or other places. And after training a neural network and artificial intelligence systems with about 130,000 images, we were able to replicate the, the skill of the best Stanford board-certified dermatologists. And we already have now examples where 
clinicians have used the system in the field and spotted melanomas that they themselves didn't see and, and sent to biopsy and found that they themselves made a mistake and, and, and our system was able to spot it. I Sebastian, I have to take a break there, right there. We're exploring the way forward for artificial intelligence, which really does mean the way forward for the human race. I'm Ray Suarez. This is On Point. Up first, it may be just the podcast you didn't know you were looking for. It's the morning news podcast from NPR. You can put it on during breakfast or while you're commuting, and you'll be caught up for the day in just about 10 minutes. That's it. Find Up First on the NPR One app or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is On Point. I'm Ray Suarez. We're hearing the debate between two scientists in the world of artificial intelligence, and it's not a theoretical debate anymore about what our computers will do when they become, as they will, smarter than we are. My guests are Sebastian Thrun, founding director of Stanford University's Artificial Intelligence Lab, and Stuart Russell, founder of the Center for Human-Compatible Artificial Intelligence at UC Berkeley. Joshua has been patiently waiting in Newport News, Virginia. Joshua, welcome. Thank you, Ray. So... Uh, I'm a cybersecurity specialist at the Newport News Shipyard, and I have uh, plenty of friends in cybersecurity and ethical hackers. And we talk all the time about different vulnerabilities and threats that new systems come through. And when it comes to the development of AI, or robots as we'll call them, we actually referenced a sci-fi movie that came out rather recently uh, called iRobot featuring Will Smith. Uh, The robots had a core set of three protocols and actually to keep order and maintain safety. And the first protocol is you shall not hurt any human, bring harm to any human. Second protocol, you shall obey every human's command as long as it does not conflict with the first protocol. Finally, the third command is that you can protect your own systems as long as it does not interfere with the second or first protocol. And yes, in the movie, there's a catastrophic event, but that's all about sci-fi. The core of the value is that we looked in the systems and that if you actually put that in place, all this fear can be undermined by a simple solution. On top of the idea that there are, there is, of course, the everlasting effect of user errors, is that when it comes to it, humans do cause the issues. And if anyone wants to hurt something, they can. But if you're talking about AI systems by themselves causing mayhem, you follow the three rules of robotics, it simply won't happen. Stuart Russell, did Isaac Asimov give us a, a good template to begin uh, your hoped-for code of ethics? Uh, yeah, so Asimov's laws are quite interesting. He actually designed them not to to prevent robots from uh, from taking over the world, but actually to, to create interesting plots for his stories. Um, but they are actually quite interesting to, to think about. So the the big question comes around what do we mean by harm? Um, so it, it actually goes on to say, or, or by inaction, allow a human to come to harm. Um, and the, the clear weakness uh, in the laws is that it doesn't consider um, uncertainty. So if I, uh, if I am a household robot and my owner is about to get in the car and drive to work, then I should prevent him from getting in the car because... Uh, there's a chance while he's driving to work that he would get uh, hurt in a car crash. And therefore, I shouldn't allow him to do that. And you, you take this to an extreme, you know, I shouldn't allow him to go in the sun because a photon might strike his skin and initiate uh, a cancer um, which might eventually kill him. So I have to sort of run around with the sunshade over him at all times and so on and so forth. So, so uh, uh, the the problem you get with that type of law is the same sort of problem you get with... Um, with the King Midas uh, request to have everything turned to gold, that when you take it literally, uh, you get these really, really catastrophically bad outcomes. Um, and uh, what I've actually been thinking about is is how do we avoid um, this sort of fundamental problem, right? So if, if you make machines that are more intelligent than us, and intelligence is is what gives you power over the world. So we're saying, we want to make machines that are more powerful than us, but we want them to have no power whatsoever. You know, that's a good trick if you can do it. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out how to do that trick. Uh, and the trick seems to be um, that uh, while, the, so the first law actually needs to be changed a bit, that the, ma- the machine's job is 
to help human beings realize their preferences. Um, and the second law is actually that the machines do not know what those preferences are. And this, this kind of humility is crucial because if the machine uh, ever believes that it knows exactly what the objective is, then nothing you can do will divert it from the course of action that it has chosen. Flying right uh, in the face of Isaac Asimov's uh, three rules of robotics is the video Slaughterbots. My guest, Stuart Russell, commissioned the 2017 video to illustrate the problem of weapons that do not need human instructions to complete their missions. In this scene, someone, the technologist, is presenting his new product, a tiny killer drone that reads social media to find and kill whoever fits the description of enemy that a human being gave it. He throws the drone out into the audience, and the drone flies back to the stage and fires an explosive charge into the head of a enemy mannequin. Just like any mobile device these days, it has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Did you see that? That little bang is enough to penetrate the skull and destroy the contents. Bizarrely, members of the audience applaud, and you could hear them whistling in the background, but that uh, slaughterbot punched a hole in the, a mannequin's brain. You can see the complete slaughterbots video at our website, onpoint.org. Uh, Sebastian Thrun, I'm sure you've seen this video. What do you make of it? It's, <clears throat> it's a great work of fiction, honestly. Uh, that technology shown there doesn't exist. But yes, weapon systems do exist. And we as a country have for a long time used drone technology to do precision strikes in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And those are guided by people. It's very important to understand that for these technologies that are being weaponized or cybersecurity attacks and similar things, there's usually people behind this as bad actors from North Korea and bad state actors, bad terrorists, bad individuals, bad corporations. And what we got to do is hold these entities accountable when something like bad like this happens. That is not to say that all technology is evil. There's any technology, and AI being no exception, can certainly be abused. But if you look at the current situation, for example, of cybersecurity, and I really like Joshua's comments, um, I think the, the real threat in the cybersecurity world is actually people. It's actors who want to benefit for their own benefit, abuse technology today. And technology has become very complex, and as a result, has many ways you can abuse technology. Again, you can see the Slaughterbots video at our website, onpointradio.org. Columbia, Missouri. Ray, welcome to the program. Hi, how are you? Okay. I think, that there, I think there are two major issues here, uh, that once you have a technology and you unleash that technology, it has a life of its own. And you talk about bad actors. The world is full of bad actors. So maybe some thought ought to be maybe to look at, should this technology be released? And technology that's smarter than humans? No, no, we don't need that. The next problem that we have, and this is a major one, and this is the cause of all of our other problems, overpopulation, too many humans. Now, if you have technology that does a job that's dangerous to a human, okay. But if you have technology that replaces a human because it's cheaper, not okay. We are in knee-deep in humans, and nobody ever, ever talks about our population problem. Well, Ray, just a it's few good. moments ago, we heard Sebastian Thrun talking about uh, detection machines that can uh, find melanoma on someone's skin uh, with a greater accuracy than a trained clinician. Isn't that a good use of, of our machines and our machines being better at something than we are? Well, I don't think so, because you're replacing somebody that makes a half a million dollars a year and think of where all that money goes. You've got a machine, you know, where does that money go? We well, need people doing those types of things. We need better education. Let's spend our money on getting uh, in public education and get people that are that are smarter than a machine. Now I take your point, but there are no half million dollar a year dermatologists in northern Syria or western Iraq right now. 
and uh, there are probably people who need uh, a good skin exam to find out if they are in the early stages of skin cancer. Ray from Columbia, Missouri, thanks a lot for your call. Saco, Maine is next. Ethan, welcome to the program. Hey, Ray. Great to be with you. Thanks for taking my call. Um, my question is, well, first of all, this is scary stuff, and I'm actually, it's, you know, I'm scared. Uh, I think this needs to be looked at, like put at the top of the list. Um, mm-hmm. First reason, I think, is... It's, you guys are talking about the benign, you know, uh, intelligence in the future, but uh, or making them benign. But right now, I'm seeing it invading lives. Um, like specifically, I'm on Tinder, and I've noticed that I get, you know, I get uh, sort of uh, bot type things, catfishers, whatever you want to call them. And then they, if you respond to something, it looks like that, then, then the next bio you get, uh, person you get is, can be, uh, ask you the, or can, can, can grow on the questions that you just put, you know, put forth with the other person. So it, it's like it's, they're, it's learning. And so it's, it's here and it's now, and I think it, it's, it's disturbing. I guess it's the new normal. The, the second thing I want to say is, is, uh, on an international level, this could be very disturbing if uh, wires get crossed uh, between world leaders. And it, you, 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 your your um, panel guy was talking about the uh, it's a lot of times malicious, and there's people behind it. So, could you know it, it's very concerning that we get on top of this and don't let it um, get out of hand with the international scale. Uh, Ethan making an interesting point on on Tinder, it might be annoying, irritating, even a little creepy to know that it is a non-human intelligence that's taking advantage of things that it's learning from you uh, and and messing up your experience on a on a dating site. But there are, if you uh, project that out, Stuart Russell, uh, far more malign uh, applications for that same uh, human like ability to converse with somebody and probably useful ones as well. Uh, That's true. I mean, as a sort of hobby, I've been arguing that uh, we should avoid completely humanoid AI systems at all costs, meaning ones that are physically indistinguishable from humans the way they are in Westworld and and humans, the the television series and others. Um, Because it's a you know, it's a form of lying, you know, through our subconscious. We cannot help but interpret the human form as a human being. Um, and to the extent that systems pretend to be human, uh, they are lying to us. And and I don't really like the idea that there are bots um, on these chat sites. I think every bot should be declaring itself to be a bot uh, rather than uh, pretending to be a human. Um, but l- let me come back to, to uh, the two issues that, Quickly, callers please. have raised, both mm-hmm. of which are, are extremely important. Um, one is the question of employment. And um, I'm afraid that uh, this is nothing to do with AI. This is economics. Um, if we develop human-level AI, you know, the value of that is comparable to the GDP of the entire planet, if not many multiples of that. So the economic momentum behind creating AI and using AI to fulfill all the economic functions uh, is really going to be irresistible. And the question is, what are humans going to do? Now, if you look at the last 200 years, uh, we've had a lot of economic growth, but we've done it largely by using humans as robots. Most people in most jobs are being used as robots, um, and they do their best to have a good time despite that. Um, And now we're worried that that's going away. It will be incredibly disruptive but we have to look forward, I think, to a future where humans don't have to be robots anymore. And we need to reorganize our education system and the way we think about our economy so that the things that humans will be doing, which is mostly uh, working to improve each other's lives directly, um, are actually remunerated, 
uh, that people are skilled and trained in doing that, that they're credentialized, they're professional. Well, that, that uh, perfectly they, tees they up Sebastian good, uh, because income. he's been trying to develop driverless cars. And one of the largest single occupations for men in the United States is driver. Uh, so we're going to have to deal with the, the downstream effects of, of your advances, Sebastian. Well, I also started a company called Udacity, where we taught you know, almost 10 million people tech skills and uh, people that come to us and learn with us. It's like a university, find jobs in places like Silicon Valley. I think the way in these things is the way forward. Honestly, if we could relieve people of the necessity to drive trucks and they could drive trucks from their living room and have the same income, I think the world would be a better place. We've, we've, in the last hundreds of years, we invented technology like running water, water toilets, penicillin, electricity, things that we've come to rely on. I challenge anybody who questions the principle of progress to go back mentally to the time 400 years ago when all of us were farmers and ask the question, is that the life you wish to live today? That's that. That I get. Well, back back when most people on the planet were farmers, they were also living to about forty years old as well. And I'm correct. I'm, we probably correct. don't want to go back to that world either. Correct. Yeah, but I, I think it's it's also saying worth saying Africa, that about seventy percent of employed people in Africa work in farming today. And ask yourself the question: Is that the life you want to live? Because by making by in, by making us superhumans, by giving us superhuman power when we plow fields, because superhuman voice when we use a cell phone, we've basically empowered ourselves to be free from very simple, repetitive work. And that is progress that I personally cherish. I love my job. Well, I'm going to have to stop it there only because, not, not because we've settled anything, but because the tyranny of the clock uh, is uh, making us come, this, uh, come to a close. Sebastian Thrun is founding director of Stanford University's Artificial Intelligence Lab. He joined us from Palo Alto. Sebastian, thanks for your time. And Stuart Russell is founder of the Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence at UC Berkeley. He joined me from Paris. Stuart, good to talk to you. Thank you, Ray. Good night. And you can continue the conversation and get the On Point podcast at our website, onpointradio.org, and follow us on Twitter and find us on Facebook at On Point Radio. Coming up tomorrow, 